Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we commemorate the given of the Holy Spirit to the church. So in light of that, our message today is entitled, The Promise of Pentecost. Also, I want us to remember, tomorrow is Memorial Day. It is the day that we remember and honor the memory of our fallen soldiers. Please play the video. They stood as heroes in our midst, with courage in their hearts and fists. And with each step they faced the call to serve their land, to give their all. They left behind their homes and kin for fields of battle fierce and grim. With steadfast hearts and selfless grace to fight for freedom in every place. They marched across the dusty sands to foreign shores and distant lands. And there they fought with all their might in blazing sun and darkest night. Their names now etched in history's page, a lasting tribute for every age to those who served and fell in line to keep our freedoms ever shine. For those who paid the ultimate cost, their lives laid down, their battles lost, their sacrifice a priceless gain for the freedom we proudly claim. We honor them with every breath and cherish them beyond their death, their bravery a beacon bright guiding us through the darkest night. So let us pledge with all our might to keep their legacy shining bright and hold them close within our heart, their memories never to depart. Our hearts are saddened, yet we're thankful for each one of our brave soldiers who gave the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we enjoy today. Without their brave sacrifice, we would not have what we have and that we have taken for granted. So we honor every fallen soldier from the American Revolutionary War right down to today. As our fathers, and our mothers, our brothers, and our sisters, our sons, and our daughters, our nephews, and our nieces, our cousins, and our friends are still paying the heavy price for freedom. We are grateful for each and every one. And we want to thank you, the families of the fallen soldiers. Thank you for selflessly given so much, we honor you. We choose to remember and never to forget the great sacrifice that they made. And so, let us not let them trample on the blood of our beloved fallen soldiers who sacrificed everything. Let us not let them make their sacrifice of no effect. Yes, they are gone, but they are not forgotten. We will remember. Turn with me please to our scripture found in Acts chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when they had come together, they asked him, 
Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus instructed his disciples to tarry, or to stay in Jerusalem, and wait for the promise of the Father. He said it was the same promise that he himself had told them about then he clarified it so that there would be no doubt in their minds as to what it was that he was talking about. He said in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 and 5, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There was no question about what Jesus was saying. The Father had promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit from a long, long time before, even from the days of Joel, from the days of the prophets, God had a promise. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even of the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. There are other places where this prophecy is also found as well. Although we're not going to read them all. We're not even going to read and I just want to list a few of them. And I want to encourage you to take note and go back later on and read them for yourselves. Here's a list of the more notable ones. Isaiah 32, 15. Ezekiel 39, 29. Zechariah 12, 10, amongst others. This promise pointed to the day of Pentecost. God was so invested in this promise that he established a holiday which he called Feast of Weeks. The Israelites were instructed um, as a shadow of things to come to continually keep the feast year after year at the same time from generation to generation. It was on this very day of celebration that the promise found its fulfillment. What exactly was the promise of the Father that those prophets prophesied about? And God was so invested in that he created a had to attend pilgrimage feast in the honor of its fulfillment. Well, the very next chapter in the book of Acts tells us, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty Russian wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Peter said that that, that event was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made in Joel chapter 2 when he would pour out his spirit on the newly formed church. All of that was to come in time, and now, in Acts chapter 2, it was fulfilled. I heard someone say it this way, the greatest treasure that God had to give was Jesus, and the greatest treasure Jesus had to give was the Holy Spirit. So the question is, why did they have to wait if Jesus had already given them authority? But when did Jesus give them authority? Well, turn with me please to 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Jesus had given them authority, but he also wanted us, those who would come later, those of us who would accept him as Lord and Savior, those of us who would become Christians. He wanted to give us that same authority that they had and even more, that we could do even more than he did. Besides that, that authority that he gave his disciples was just temporary authority given to his disciples at, for that time. The see, Jesus was given authority and that authority was backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it only lasted as long as Jesus was alive. When Jesus died and then rose again, that agreement, that authority was canceled. Jesus, as a man, was given authority on earth, according to Matthew chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. His authority was backed by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is, in essence, the power of the Holy Trinity. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It was not the Most High that overshadowed her. He wasn't doing the overshadowing. It was the power of the Most High who overshadowed. The breath of God. See, the angel told Mary it was because of this that her son would be holy and would be called the Son of God. Here's what Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. God promised to put his spirit upon the coming Messiah. Then Jesus proclaimed this in the beginning of his ministry, in fulfillment of that promise. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was the fulfillment of God's promise to him through Isaiah that we just read, that promise. There is no doubt that Jesus was given authority. There's no doubt that the Holy Spirit was upon Jesus and that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's no doubt that the power behind the authority that Jesus had or that Jesus was given was the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said he did nothing on his own accord. John chapter 5 verse 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. I want us to dig a little bit deeper into this word authority. This is the meaning and usage of the word authority. And I will be paraphrasing and quoting all at the same time for you. This Greek word, esousia, translated authority, denotes the ability to perform an action to the extent that there are no hindrances in the way. It is different and distinct, however, from dynamis, which means power in the sense of intrinsic ability. See, authority does not have intrinsic ability. It does not have the intrinsic power backing its own authority. It only has 
the authority. And it has to be backed by intrinsic ability or intrinsic power. Understand that no one possessing the authority is, or the one who is possessing the authority is not the one with the power behind the authority. Also, this is really important to understand. Asusia is also the ability granted by a higher norm or court and therefore affords the right to do something or the right over something. However, this authority is illusory unless backed by real power. We have been granted authority by a higher court, the courts of heaven. If all of heaven was not in agreement, Jesus would not have been able to give us such great authority. But he has given us great authority. And so we must understand that Asusia is the authority to do or to perform and not the power behind that performance. Jesus said that all authority was given to him. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, all authority was granted to Jesus by the courts of heaven. And now it is Jesus's. It all belongs to Jesus so he can give as he sees fit. It is backed by the power of of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said that it is to our own advantage, to our advantage that he go so that the Holy Spirit might come. John chapter 16, verse 7. Why did the Holy Spirit have to come? Because every authority requires backing. Jesus could give us the authority to use his name, but the authority to use his name needed back in. It needed the power of the Holy Spirit and that is why it was expedient for him to go. The Jews understood that and that is why they questioned Jesus. Turn with me please to Matthew chapter 21 verse 23. And when he entered the temple the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? They knew Jesus had authority to do whatever it was that he was doing. But they knew that every authority had to have backing. Backing a power to enforce it. For instance, behind legal authority stands the power of the state to give it validity. And the right to exercise the authority are supported by the law and by the power of the state. I can remember one time when my kids were still in school and I was on my way to pick them up. Right in front of me was a truck with some rough looking people in it. They were not wearing seatbelts. Then a police car drove up. We were waiting at for, for the light to change. That police car drove up and I noticed them scrambling to get their seatbelts on. The policeman, as I looked at him, he was not like a big person. If not for the uniform and the authority of the badge and the power of the state behind the authority of the badge, he could not stand up to those rough looking guys, those rough looking people in the truck. That, my friend, is authority backed by power in action. The power behind the name of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Now that we understand authority, what is power? The word translated power is the Greek word dynamis. It is the basic meaning of being able. It has that basic meaning of capacity in virtue of an ability with the stress falling on being able. 
Power is the potentate of God. Nothing is impossible for God to do. The Holy Trinity works as one. Therefore, it is not always possible to identify the difference between authority and power. Yet, there is a difference. That is what happened after Peter and John healed the lame man at Gate Beautiful. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Man of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Peter was emphatic about this. It is not us. We do not have that kind of power. The power do not belong to us. We have the authority to use that power, but the power does not belong to us. So what was Peter's conclusion on how he had performed such a great and undeniable miracle? Acts chapter 3, verse 16. And his name, by faith, in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all Peter openly admitted it was neither he nor John that made the man walk but faith in the name of Jesus that made him perfectly healthy they had been given the authority to use the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit living in them made it happen. It was a co-op. They believed the promise found in John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. And some of us need to grab a hold of that ourselves. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That is Jesus speaking, that is Jesus' promise to us, that is Jesus' promises to his bride, us, the church. We must grab a hold of that promise. We must believe it. We must live it. We must act upon it. You see, Jesus said that whoever believes in him, not just the apostles, not just the early believers, but everyone, whomsoever believes, can ask, and it will be done for them. But how can we invoke such a mighty and majestic name. John chapter 15, verse 7 through 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. We must abide in Jesus and his words must abide in us. There is no other way but that way. And we can only abide in Jesus through prayer and devotion. We can only abide in Jesus by spending time in his presence. Look, on that great and exciting day of Pentecost, when the promise of Pentecost was fulfilled and the Holy Spirit fell on the first church, the believers were all gathered together in one accord and were devoting themselves to prayer according to Acts chapter 1 verse 14. The promise had come. It was finally fulfilled. The reconciliation of man back to God was here. Then immediately after being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
the believers began to boldly testify. They began to boldly witness. They began to boldly speak about the things of God. And 3,000 souls were saved. Then they went around performing great signs and wonders. And many miracles were brought by their hands. That same promise is promised to us believers today. All we have to do is forge and foster a real relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't be wishy-washy. You can't be slack in prayer. You cannot be half-heartedly and think that all of these blessings and, and all of these promises of the promise of Pentecost will somehow magically rest upon us, somehow magically be ours. The works of righteousness, which include prayer, good works, being a witness, testifying, administering the word of God, along with others, is hard work. They're all difficult. It's not something easy. It is work. It is laborious. It requires sweat and tears. The writer of the book of Hebrews said that in the, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus himself found it hard work. Jesus himself offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and with tears. It's not something easy to do. This is not a hop along Sunday thing. It is difficult. It is hard work and it requires a strong commitment to receive the promise of Pentecost. Jesus often spent all night in prayer. He definitely got up early very early every morning to go and find a place, a solitary pray, place of prayer. And there he prayed for long seasons of time. Look at what else is promised. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. God said that part of the promise of Pentecost, this also included, is that he would change the speech of the peoples. Not just people, as in a certain group of people, but peoples, as in every tribe, every nation, every tongue, everyone who would come to believe on the name of Jesus, who would come to put their, their trust in the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God said he would change their speech to a pure speech. Why would he give us believers a pure speech? So that we can call upon his name in one accord. The scriptures tell us that in our weakness, the time of our weakness, we do not know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us at those times with groanings that cannot be uttered in words. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. But the requirement is one accord. The very thing the believers were doing the day that the Holy Spirit came charging to earth with the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And tongues of fire appeared and dividing, they came and they sat upon each head that was present there that day. And everyone began to speak with that pure speech God had promised to his church through the prophet Zephaniah. It's a gift. And God is very insulted when you refuse a gift that he has offered to you. Especially the one that cost him so much. The servant who refused to use his talent had his talent taken away from him. And he was called a wicked servant. And that master ordered his other servants to take that one away. And to throw him out, put him out into utter darkness. 
How can we put the promise of Pentecost into action? By stirring it up in us. Here's what Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of hands. This word translated, fan into flame, is the Greek word, anisoperio. It means just that, to fan into flame, or inflame or to rekindle. Now, to rekindle would suggest a kind of dying ember, even a fire that is going out. And that person has to blow on it in order to fan it back or to rekindle it back into flames so that that flame can, can begin to grow again and glow bright and beautiful as it did once long ago. But this is not the first time that we find Paul encouraging Timothy to use the gift that is in him. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Again, Paul is reminding Timothy not to neglect the gift that was in him. The gift that was given to him. But to use it. Practice using it, Timothy. This is how we stir up the gifts that are in us. We must put them into action. We must use them. We must practice these things, Paul says. We must continue to use our gifts until we have perfected them. And even then, we must continue to put them into use through faith in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we don't, the same thing that Paul is warning the Thessalonians not to let happen will happen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians, do not quench the Spirit, but let the Spirit flow, and let the services flow as the Spirit leads. Paul also instructs the, the Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen, we have been given a great and awesome promise. The promise of Pentecost. Not that we can make a big name for ourselves or that we can draw large crowds on a weekend, but so that we might glorify the Father by glorifying the Son. We can only do that by bearing the fruit of the Spirit which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And moving in the gifts of the Spirit, we have to invoke these gifts. The gifts are that Paul said, Paul said the gifts are the utterance of wisdom, the utterance of knowledge, faith, Gifts of healing, the working of miracles, prophecy, the ability to distinguish between spirits, various kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. These are not all of the manifestations of the spirit, but only some of the manifestations. And they are given to us, each one of us, for the common good, of the whole body. No man is an island and no one stands alone. Just like there is but one loaf, we are but one body. We are to encourage one another to bear fruit. 
We're to build each other up with our gifts. But it all starts with the knowing of Jesus. We must know Jesus personally. We must accept him as Lord and Savior so that he can give to us his authority. He do not give his authority to strangers. Jesus does not give his authority to any and everyone, but only to his servants, only to his friends, only to those that he has redeemed and who has a relationship with him. So would you like to know him today? Would you like to have a relationship with him? All you have to do is to ask. And how do you ask? Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Increase my faith that I might do good works, that I might bear the fruit that was just spoken about, that I might operate in the gifts of the Spirit that Paul encouraged us to move in. Help me to live for you every day. And I'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. Take down your Bible off the shelf and read your Bible every single day. Highlight those verses, those promises. Memorize those promises. Encourage yourself in those promises. Those promises are real and true and Jesus will fulfill every single promise. Whatever you ask, it will be done for you. But you've got to delight yourself in Him. You've got to abide in Him. How do you do that? By joining a church like-minded. Not one of those progressive churches that do anything and embraces everything and embraces the world and do not see sin. But join a Bible-believing church who still believes in the power and the authority Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Memorial Day to each one. Be safe. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.